Hello family. What an awesome day it is this morning. Thank you once again for hosting us in your homes, offices, or wherever you may be watching or listening from. We hope you are well, safe, and joyful this morning. We welcome you to our church at home service. If you are joining us for the first time, welcome. We were expecting you and have prepared for you. We would like to get to know you better. So please click the link in the description box and fill in the welcome card. This morning, I am just reminded of King David in Psalm 122 verse 1, which says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Let us be glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Let us be glad in our deeds and our fellowship with him this morning. Let us enter his gates with praise and thanksgiving. He deserves our gladness, for he alone has been good to us. He has been faithful and trustworthy. As we go into worship, let us enter with open hearts and hearts filled with gratitude. After worship, Auntie Regina will give us the offering message, followed by Mr. Mahudi with the word of God. Be blessed. The setting's the 
such an honor and a privilege to stand before you to be able to off, uh, to share an offering message. Our message comes from Mark chapter 12 verse 43 to 44. The same account is given by Luke in chapter 21 verse 1 to 4. 
The message is called The Widow's Offering. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offering were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more than into the treasure than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. What do we learn from this message? Firstly, God sees what man overlooks. The big gifts in the temple were surely noticed by the people. That is probably what the disciples were watching. But Jesus saw what no one else did. He saw the humble gift of a poor widow. This was the gift that Jesus thought was worth of the comment. This was the gift that the disciples needed to be aware of. In this season, we may be tempted to believing like we have nothing to give. But as long as we are alive, we have something to give in the kingdom of God. Secondly, God's evaluation is different from man's. The widow's two copper coins added up to a penny, according to man's tabulation. But Jesus said that she had given more than anyone else that day. How could this be? when many rich people threw in large amounts. The difference is one of proportion. The rich were giving large amounts, but they still retained their fortune. The widow put in everything, all she had to live on. Jesus sees the heart. God knows what we have and what we don't have. Thirdly, God commends giving in faith. Here was a woman in need of receiving charity, yet she had a heart to give, even though the amount was negligible. What could a widow's copper coins buy? She gave in faith that God could use it. The widow's faith is also evident in the fact that she gave the last of her money, like the widow of Zarephath, who gave, the, who gave her last meal to Elijah. See uh, First Kings chapter 17, verse 7 to 16. The widow in the temple gave away her last means of self-support. Does that mean that the widow left the temple, completely destitute, went home and died of starvation? No. The Bible teaches that God provides for our needs. His attitude echoes what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Our God is brothers and sisters. We don't know the details of this particular widow's future, but we can be certain that she was provided for. Just as God provided for the widow and her son in Elijah's day, God will also provide for us. He has always done. God is a giver. That is his nature. John chapter 3 verse 16 sums up everything. It says that, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Shall we pray? O God, our heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise. We honor you, mighty God, for everything that you do for us. Thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with so many gifts, so many blessings, my God. Even as we come before you, Father, we boldly and surrender ourselves and everything that we have and all that we are, my God. As we bring our tithes and offering, Father, we just want to pray that you bless everything. We ask all this to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hi Church, we hope you are all doing well. I'd like to personally invite you to our next in-person Sunday or Wednesday church gatherings. We understand that safety is a priority for most people right now. And I can assure you that we are taking all the necessary precautions to make sure that you and your family will be safe before, during, and after the church gathering. So here are some of the things that you can expect 
at any of our in-person church gatherings. Upon arrival, you'll be greeted by our fantastic check-in managers who will scan your temperature and make sure that you have filled in the COVID-19 declaration form. To ensure a smooth and contactless check-in experience, we ask that you uh, pre-book your seat online and also fill in the COVID-19 declaration form prior to your arrival at church. If you are also signing up for other members of your family, make sure that you have filled in the COVID-19 declaration form for each member of your family. As you enter the auditorium, uh, one of our ushers is going to help you to find your seat. Now, our seats have been spaced out to allow for a safe physical distance between you and those that are around you. But you also have the option of sitting next to your family members and your loved ones. We ask that you kindly keep your face mask on, covering both your nose and your mouth throughout the time that you will be on the church premises. Because your safety and the safety of those that are around you is one of our top priorities. And lastly, as awesome as Church at Home has been, we know and we can assure you that it cannot compare to an in-person church gathering. So I cannot wait to see you on our next church gathering. Take care and God bless you. Good morning, church. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Indeed, it is a privilege to be a father. Let me ask you this. Have you ever had a rough day? Then you interact with someone and they say things like, Wow, you look good today. Thank you for your valid points. You are so smart. I didn't know that, but thank you for informing me. Or wow, your presence in my life is a delight. What would that do for you? How would that impact the rough day you're already having? Now imagine instead someone said to you, why would you wear those pants with that shirt? They don't match. I knew you would mess that up. There are no surprises here. That mistake you made last year, I knew you would do it again. You will never amount to anything. You are just like your father or you are just like your mother. You will never change. How would that make you feel? Yep. Some of us have been in an unfortunate position to have experienced things like that said to our lives. I won't go into detail as to how that made me feel, but I'm sure we can all agree things like that would evoke feelings we would wish to forget. If you know anything about biology, you would have already guessed what today's message is about. The tongue that builds to last. I must admit, just the name of the topic alone was so convicting and so challenging for me. And up front, I would like to say a couple of things. This message is not meant to condemn or leave you feeling guilty in any way. God wants us to learn and be convicted. He will show us how to correct and move forward without feeling guilty or condemned. Secondly, this message is for everyone hearing it, the young and the mature. I know I tend to think, Aish, I wish my wife was here to hear this sermon, or my boss, or my father, etc. No, this message is for you today, not anybody else. Let's dive right into it. King Solomon in Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 19, gives us a glimpse of what God hates. It reads, these six things the Lord hates. Indeed, seven are repulsive to him. A proud look, the attitude that makes one overestimate oneself and discount others. A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that creates wicked plans, feet that run swiftly to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies even half-truths, and one who spreads discord or rumors amongst brothers. We learn that of the six things King Solomon says God hates, three of them can be directly attributed to our tongues. A lying tongue, a false witness who breathes out lies, 
and even half-truths, and one who spreads discord and rumors amongst brothers. It is clear that our tongues can really get us into trouble with God. If we lie or tell half-truths, if we spread discord or disharmony, the tongue has power. How much power? Well, in Proverbs 18, verse 21, we read, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The tongue has the power to destroy or to build. The tongue can bring death. It can also bring life. The message translation of the same verse actually says, Words kill, words give life. They are either poison or fruit. You choose. If I always speak negatively to myself, to God, to people around me, my life will generally take a negative course. And if I generally speak positively, then my life will generally take a positive course. I get to choose whether my tongue builds a life-giving legacy that lasts or my tongue builds a destructive death-bringing legacy that also lasts. I thought this is so unfair, God, because some of us don't know how to be positive. We believe we are wired to be pessimistic and negative. Well, guess what? That is why you're hearing this message today. God wants to rewire some stuff if we let him. Are we willing to let him? James, in chapter 3 of his letter, addresses comprehensively this issue of the power of the tongue and helps us to understand and appreciate the gravity of this power. Bear with me as we go and read James 3, verses 1 to 12. Then we are going back to unpack each verse. Are we ready? It reads as follows. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. Even through the winds, or rather, even when the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. Among all parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting the entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come out pouring of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No. You can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Interesting and direct explanation by James. Let us unpack each verse. Verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. James is saying those who teach will be judged more strictly because they ought to know better. They have been entrusted with God's word to share and teach others. You see, a simple slip of the tongue amongst a group of friends 
is not as devastating as a slip of the tongue made on the pulpit. We all agree that words taught from the pulpit carry a lot of weight, and as teachers, we need to filter out our personal preferences of culture and just teach the gospel. And then, more importantly, live it out every day. Jesus assures us in Matthew 12, verse 36, that we are going to give account for every idle or careless or useless word we speak. Careless words are words we say without thinking. They seem harmless at the time, but they can do great damage. So if you can have a small audience that you teach the word of God, be it on the pulpit, at home, at work, don't use careless words. Think before you speak. Because by virtue of you just being a teacher, you will be judged more strictly. To whom great power is given, great responsibility is required. That is from Luke 12, verse 48. Are we still together? Let's jump to verse 2. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect or mature and could also control ourselves in every other way. Perfect in this verse means mature. The maturity of a Christian is measured by how he or she controls their tongue. This is scary for me, and I'm glad James says, we all make many mistakes in how we speak. So we all fall short of being perfect. We all fall short of being mature. He further says, if we can control our tongues, we could also control ourselves, our whole bodies, in every other way. The Amplified Version says, If we can control our tongues, we can control our whole nature. Clearly, words are important. Spoken words can bring direction or destruction. James then makes three examples or metaphors to illustrate why heavy control of the tongue can reign in your entire life. He shows us how powerful the tongue is. In verse 3 to 5, he says, We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. A horse is a powerful animal made mainly of muscle, but with a small bit in its mouth, we can control it. With a small bit in its mouth, we can make it turn left, right, or make it stop. With a small bit in its mouth, we can control the horse's entire body. James carries on and says, A small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. Again, a small rudder can give direction to a huge ship, even though the winds are strong. Just like a small bit, the small rudder of a, on a ship is powerful. What the bit is to the horse and the rudder is to the ship, so is my tongue to my life. What the bit is to the horse and the rudder is to the ship, so is my tongue to my life. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. A tongue is a small thing compared to the rest of our bodies. It is a small thing compared to the rest of our lives. Yet the word of God says, a tiny spark, that is our tongue, can set a great forest on fire. The great forest being our lives or the lives of those close to us. The tongue is powerful, church. The tongue can build or it can destroy. Words change lives. In verses 6 to 8, James illustrates to us that our tongues are necessary but dangerous. Among all parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting the entire body. 
it can set your life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, James says, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. What is interesting to note here, firstly, is that James says the tongue is a flame of fire. He doesn't say the tongue is like a flame of fire. He says the tongue is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting the entire body. It can do what? It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. Now, here's the very fascinating part for me. James says no one can tame the tongue. We can tame all kinds of animals, tigers, lions, snakes, even sharks, but no one can tame the tongue. So what hope do I have if I can't tame so what hope do I have if I can't tame my own tongue? Earlier he said spiritual maturity is shown by the control of the tongue. Now he says no man can tame the tongue. We'll come back to this in a second. In verses 9 to 12, James shows us inconsistent nature of our tongues. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come out pouring from the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Think about that. The same tongue can sing beautiful praise songs to God, then turn around and curse those who have been made in the image of God. As a father in my home, my tongue that glorifies God can speak sarcastically to my wife and harshly to my children. Surely this is not right, James says, but it happens. James asks these rhetorical questions to crystallize his point regarding the inconsistency of the tongue. Does a spring of water bubble with fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. In other words, the tongue is a spring of water that produces both bitter and sweet water. It is like a fig tree that produces olives and a grapevine that produces figs. This can be right, but this is how we are. So thank you, James. Now we understand that the tongue can give direction or destruction. As small as it is, it can determine the course of our entire lives. It can corrupt our entire body. It is inconsistent. Why is the tongue like this? Why can the tongue give life and death? Jesus nailed it when he was speaking to the Pharisees in Luke 6, verses 43 and 45. A good tree can produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can produce good fruit. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. An evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. You see, what comes out of my tongue is a direct reflection of what is in my heart. My heart is like a well and my tongue is like the bucket. If I sink the bucket down the well, the type of water I will get purely depends on the health of the well, not the bucket. Are we together? This kind of excites me because, like earlier James said, no man can tame the tongue. And the tongue is a direct reflection of what is in the heart. Similarly, no man can change the condition of his own heart. So we're kind of off the hook here. I can't, change, I can't change the condition of my heart, and I can't tame my tongue. 
It is not my responsibility. In fact, it's way above my pay grade. The psalmist says in Psalm 51 verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew the right spirit within me. It is Jesus who creates a new heart. He transforms us. It is his responsibility. From that new heart will flow streams of living water to our tongues, then to the rest of the world. But we are not really off the hook, are we? We have a responsibility too. Jesus won't force himself into our lives. We first have to accept him as our Lord and Savior. Then we must renew our minds daily to ensure that the new heart that he has given us remains pure. If you're a Christian and you have been for a while, you need to recognize a few symptoms coming from your tongue and then do business with God. It is not good enough to say, ah, I'm just having a bad day. No, no, no. You must pray to God and ask him to reveal to you what the symptoms your tongue is picking up mean. The tongue will indicate the state of your heart at any particular point. Just ask God to reveal to you. A harsh tongue equals an angry heart. A negative tongue shows an anxious heart. An overreactive tongue shows an unsettled heart. A filthy tongue shows an impure heart. A critical tongue shows a better heart. On the flip side, a compassionate tongue shows a loving heart. An encouraging tongue shows a joyful heart. A truthful tongue shows an honest heart. This is so shockingly true. The other day I told my sons to steam immediately when they get back from school. The instruction was simple and clear. You have to steam, then bath, then you can play. Then I got home and one of them was playing soccer outside after I had given the instruction. I was so angry at him. I started shouting at him. The poor child didn't get a chance to explain because I was so furious. When I was tired of shouting at him, he got a chance to explain. His little brother was steaming, so he was waiting for his little brother to finish so he could go steam. Such a simple and logical explanation. But I let my tongue rip into him before hearing him out. I went to my office and thought about what just happened. I have never been that angry at anyone, at least not ever since the lockdown. What was going on in my heart? What made me that angry? What was bubbling in my heart that made me overreact like that? I could quickly diagnose it to an unsettling event at work that happened earlier that week. I had an unsettled heart. I didn't know how it had affected me until my tongue showed me clear symptoms. You see, the health of our heart is a big deal. One of the biggest mistakes I've ever made as a father was overparenting the same child when he was small. I overparented him so much that by the time he was three, he couldn't do anything without checking with me if it was okay first. The child started lying to me about the smallest things. God revealed to me that I'm the reason the child is lying. I was so afraid to fail as a parent that I instilled fear of failure in my own child. So he never wanted to disappoint me by telling me the truth. So he would just lie. God revealed that I had a proud heart and that pride made me a critic. Rather, that pride gave me a critical tongue towards my child. God started to work on my heart. True story. As we raise children, God raises us too. As the kids grow, as parents, we must be willing to grow with them. We must constantly check the state of our hearts. Otherwise, we will wound these little ones forever with the venom from our tongues. Okay. There are two techniques 
I would like to teach us. These techniques we must use before we speak. The first one is the weight technique, and the second one is the four gates filter. Wait before you speak. Always pause. Wait is an acronym for why am I talking? You must first answer that question to yourself. Why am I talking? Once you're satisfied that there is a reason for you talking, then you go into the second technique, which is the four gates filter. These are the four gates our words should go through in our minds before they come out of our mouths. If we get proficient in using these four gates, we will see our words becoming more life-giving. All right, are you with me? So we did the weight technique and we have answered that yes, I have a reason for talking. Now we go into the four gates. Gate number one, is it true? Did I check the source? Do I have the full picture? Did I get both sides of the story? Did I do a fact-checking exercise? This gate ought to stop about 75% of what we're going to say. So that's gate number one, is it true? Gate number two, is it confidential? If it is confidential, then we don't need to tell it. We just need to keep quiet. By the way, very, very few people are actually confidential, so we need to be careful. Gate number one, is it true? Gate number two, is it confidential? Gate number three, is it necessary? Does this space of silence need me to say what I'm about to say? Is it important that I say this? Lastly, gate number four, is it edifying? Is it going to build up or tear down? Is it going to enhance or bring sadness? So when what I want to say doesn't get through all four of these gates, the Bible actually has a very deep and spiritual verse that instructs us. I forgot in which book it comes from, but it simply says in King James Version, shut thee up. Just shut up. Imagine we could use all these four gates well. How much would we offend each other then? How much would we wound and destroy each other's reputations? How much would we curse the identity of our children and spouses? Ephesians 4.29 says, Don't let unwholesome, foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words ever come out of your mouth. But only such speech as is good for building up others according to the need and the occasion so that it will be a blessing to those who hear you speak. Let me share with you one more story. End of June 2008. I was 18 months into my three-year articles at KPMG. Exactly halfway. I've been having a horrible time with my line manager. I decided I'm done with KPMG. I always wanted to be in business anyway, so I will not stomach the horrible treatment anymore. I spoke to my parents and my then fiance. We fasted and prayed and my decision was clear. I had so much peace with my decision because everyone who cared about me supported me 100%. And from the fasting, I had God and he supported my decision. Friday month end, June, I go see my performance manager and I give him my resignation letter. He was a Muslim man. He asks me if I'm sure and I tell him I've never been so sure about anything in my life. I tell him my whole family supports me and I have fasted. He says, John, you have worked so hard for the last 18 months and you're halfway there. Yes, your line manager is a tough and unreasonable guy. But you got so far. You and your God have committed to a three-year journey. I don't believe he would want you to quit halfway. Then he said to me, the decision is yours. It was a Friday. He tore up my resignation letter and said, Go home over the weekend and think about it. If you still want to resign on Monday, print out a new resignation letter 
and I'll ask you no questions. Needless to say, end of December 2009, I completed my three-year articles at KPMG. You see, Proverbs 23 does not say, I will take you out of the valley of the shadow of death. It says, I will walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death. My staff and rod will comfort you. I believe God used a Muslim brother as his rod and staff in that situation. I say Muslim brother because just like me, he's made in the image of God. Here's the mind-blowing part for me. That was probably a six to eight minute conversation where he tore up my resignation letter. But that six to eight minute conversation did not only change the course and direction of my life, it changed the course and direction of my future wife's life and our unborn children's lives. And if God wills it, that timely word on that right occasion has set the lives of my future grandchildren on a different trajectory too. Now in my house, we never quit. They know that quitting is a direct reflection of how much our hearts trust that Jesus will walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death. Ephesians 4.29, a timely word on the right occasion. Change the way you speak. It will change the direction of your life and the lives of those around you. In closing, I need to share an illustration so profound that I wish I never forget it for the rest of my life. We went on a leadership seminar recently and a pastor shared this illustration. He said, Imagine wherever you went, you had a dove on your shoulder. That dove represents the Holy Spirit. Now imagine making sure that whatever you say, you say it with such care, such kindness, such truth and temperament that the dove on your shoulder doesn't get scared and or startled and fly away. Just imagine your words came out with that level of care and thoughtfulness that the dove on your shoulder never gets scared. It always stays on your shoulder while you're speaking. Wow. That will surely bring spirit-filled life into every conversation, into every discussion, even into every disagreement you will ever get involved in. Remember, change the way you speak, you will change the direction of your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you very much for your word, your word that teaches us, your word that corrects us, your word that sets us on the correct path. Lord, we've all fallen short. We cannot tame our tongues, but we are so grateful that that doesn't have to condemn us because it is not our responsibility to tame our tongues. Our responsibility is to submit to you, to submit to Christ, and he will transform us. He will give us a new heart, and from that new heart will flow rivers of living water. We thank you very much, Lord, for this teaching. We thank you very much for rebuking us. And we trust you with all our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is Mondi Kren. And together with my wife, we pastor People's Church. I'm so glad that you chose to join us online today. And I pray that God uses this resource to make you more and more like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's important to note that these kinds of resources are never meant to replace the need for you to belong to a local church congregation where you are led and shepherded, a place where you can use your gifts and your resources to make a positive impact on the lives of the people around you. This is only meant to supplement and not substitute them. And lastly, I would like to ask you, if these resources have been of benefit to you, would you kindly consider giving to People's Church? This is so that we can continue to invest in technologies that help us and enable us to increase our reach and spread the message of Jesus Christ even wider and to even more people. For ways to do that, you can go to our website and click on the Giving tab and you'll see ways to be able to give. Now once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Take care and God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Mohudi, for an empowering and life-changing message. I trust you were blessed this morning and the Lord has spoken to you personally. 
Have a wonderful week and we hope to see you again on Sunday. Keep well and stay safe. Thank you.